Welcome back everybody. Um, as you know lately I've been doing a lot of comments regarding the latest races and I won't be doing a lot more of that because I just don't like it but I wanted to do something different just for the viewers. I'm Billy Smith, this is my YouTube channel and today we're talking about the Men's World Championships in Yorkshire. So I think this Yorkshire World Championship is defined by bad weather and rain. So many people think they're smart and are going to try and make their predictions regarding the rain having maybe possibly suiting other riders at the World Championships better. Well, let me tell you a quick short story. When you go into a small one week shitty race uh, for sprinters somewhere that is a week long um, you might pitch up with bad morale because you don't have a chance of really out sprinting any of the sprinters and your morale might be low. But let me tell you, when these guys pitch up at the World Championships, they are ready to go all in on this one day race and leave nothing to chance. So the rain is not really going to play a big effect on who's going to win, but there is one small catch. Most of the top contenders handle their bikes more than well enough. However, there is one small catch. Many of the really, really skinny guys, like we've seen Alejandro Valverde, who's really become quite skinny as he's gotten older, uh, might statistically have a bigger chance of cracking simply because they don't have so much reserves as guys like Alexander Kristoff, who loves the occasional 280 kilometer ride and knows how to finish it off with a strong sprint. Unfortunately, these cold and rainy conditions will count against the more climber specific riders because they won't have much as much in reserve. In relationship to other people they might have to try and eat much more but 280 kilometers however um, this morning I woke up and saw that the race is shortened down to 261 kilometers so uh, that might have a slight benefit to the skinny guys. Okay so interesting comment this morning on Twitter from Thomas De Gent is asking are riders allowed to ride in a national championship like the World Championships, uh, sorry, the World Championships um, in team clothing? So theoretically, no. But let me explain this to you. Um, in this picture, you'll see that one of the Ineos riders actually is in the Spanish national team. So he has, um, with a permanent marker, covered the other letters. So it actually, you can see the E and the S. Which is actually for which is meant for Spain. So Ineos, yes, see what he did there. But the reason they wear their team clothing is once they trust in their team clothing, they know how long that that specific team clothing will keep them warm. They know how many times during a six-hour race they might have to change that clothing. And it's really difficult for a national federation for to get that specific clothing that's going to keep the riders warm. And remember, if they aren't able to stay warm. They can obviously get very cold, lose a lot of energy and end up having a very bad result. So clothing in this regard, very important. So I think that's also why kind of a blind eye is thrown to this. Um, and also sometimes you get a jersey from the National Federation, doesn't fit well, you can't wear it. Or it's just really tight around the abdominal and it can really restrict your digestion, which can give you some really bad reflux, etc, etc. Um, but you get where I'm going with this. And like I've mentioned before, there has been a last minute route change, which I think might play into the hands of the more sprinter type of guys. So I'm going to tell you about my top five picks of the day and my two top outsiders, which I actually think might upset the field. Um, I'm just going to give you my picks and I'm not going to say predictions because when I speak about predictions, the only way you can really make a true prediction is when you're finishing up a 10k climb the race is much shorter and we kind of know who are the top four guys on great form then it's more realistic to make a prediction and to just say Mathieu van der Poel and Peter Chagan um, yeah they're good bike riders um, but remember over 280 kilometers a lot of things change in the wet a lot of things change but statistically yeah uh, Peter Sagan and Mathieu van der Poel have the best chances of actually um, winning this race however they will be heavily marked in my opinion Sagan will be more marked than Van der Poel but anyway Sagan's really a top class rider and he's very sneaky very smart and knows how to save energy so theoretically 
you would be able to save much more energy than Mathieu van der Poel over 280k race, which might then give him the upper hand. But that's just my opinion for now. And I'm going to give you the reasoning behind my five top picks and my two underdogs. And I'm an underdog type of guy. So you get where I'm going with this. Okay, so my number one pick, Mathieu van der Poel. He has great skill. He goes really well in wet conditions on a cyclocross bike. The course really, really suits him. It's short and punchy. So obviously he has a really good chance. Will he be marked? Yes. When he attacks, will many people be able to follow him? No. Will he maybe attack too early? Presumably, yes. Um, will he then blow up? Yes. Will he have spent too much energy? Yes. Can he still pull it off? Yes, he's shown that in Armstrong Gold. He can do anything after riding a little bit stupid or aggressive as well. So my second pick of the day is Alexander Kristoff. He loves the 280 kilometer rides. He loves doing long endurance ride. He has the reserves to go all the way 280 kilometers. Not saying he's fat, he's just a uh, big boned. Um, and I mean, nothing I do with that really. I'm also very big boned, which is not so nice when you're trying to survive the, the really hilly climbing races, which I actually like. And I really think he has a super fast sprint of the 280 kilometers. He loves the rain and he's really efficient on the bike. So he's my number two pick. Third will be Michael Matthews. My reason behind that is he's super light, super efficient. So going over those small bumps, he saves a lot more energy than the other sprinters who he is as equally as fast. And he's really fast in the end and he can ride 280 kilometers. Will he have enough reserves? I don't know. But he'll definitely not be marked as marked as Peter Sagan and Mathieu van der Poel. So that's why I rank him so high up. My number four pick of the day, yeah, Peter Sagan. Um, he will be heavily marked and that really, really in road cycling, unfortunately, counts against him. But he's one of the few guys who can actually handle a road bike so well that he can gap Mathieu van der Poel around the corner and actually, when making a mistake, still save it. And what I mean by this is, is that on mountain biking, when you take a corner really fast and you slip a bit, you can always correct it. You can hardly ever do that on a road bike, especially when it happens unexpectedly. Uh, the only other guy I know who can keep it up when the front wheel starts sliding like that Perhaps that I've seen before is Vicenza Nibali, but very little people. So we know if you go over the limit into the corner, 99% of the time you are coming down. Um, but Peter has been a th three time world champion. So <laughs> it's hard betting against him. He can pull anything out of the hat. And my number five pick of the day um, is Alejandro Valverde. We know he can ride 280 kilometers. He does come from Murcia, which is actually a very hot region in Spain. Um, he might be very fatigued after Vuelta España, and he might prefer 280 kilometers in the heat as opposed to the cold, and he's really skinny. He might not have so much in reserve. He might be a little bit tired from Vuelta España, but if he have recovered better than Roglic, because we've seen that of Roglic was really tired in his individual time trial when Rowan Dennis caught him which was three minutes behind him. Um, we don't know how well Valverde recovered. He didn't do the TT so he might have had more time to recover um, and he's got a decent sprint on him um, especially after a long hard race which always makes him a contender. Enough of that. Now I'm coming on to my two top picks of the day because I'm an underdog type of guy. So first, Alexi Lutsenko, we've seen him in the Italian 1.1 Classics. He did some special stuff, especially um, the first race he won, which with the 80 km solo breakaway, and then with uh, other Italian Classics, I can't exactly remember the name, but he actually attacked the bunch while they were doing a lead out, crossed over to the, I think it was, yeah, Diego Rosa them, um, which were in the break all day, and still sprinted them all in the last three kilometers. So this guy is on amazing form. I haven't seen many guys able to do that except Fabian Cancellara, who is one of them. Um, so 
he's definitely a contender if the race turns out to be really hard. And then my second underdog and topic of the day is Philippe Jobert. What I've seen from him racing in Vuelta España, he's in absolutely stunning condition. He didn't have to go every day full gas, so he'll, he'll be more uh, recovered than all the other um, GC riders. And this suit, this this course suits him perfectly. He can go long, he can do the sprint, and he can climb, and he can ride in the rain. And he's been one of the best teams in the world. He's super motivated. He can do anything. And with that, I'm got almost about to finish off this vlog. Just two things I want to mention. Look down here at the horrendous conditions they are riding in right now. It's about 180 kilometers to go and I'm about to upload this vlog. Leave your comment down below, give me your opinion. Another thing I wanna show you, uh, you know I'm a very sentimental person. What I've done on my laptop, and I'm a guy that always thinks you should remember the past because that will help you build on the future. I'll show you this later, but you can see this is my race number in Volta, signed by all of my mates that was in the team. And as the season is coming to end, I'm getting a little bit emotional. And I've also put all the stitches that were in my knee, the top, the other ones were dissolvable stitches. I have put them above on the numbers. So it's a great memory that will always be with me. And with that, I'm gonna end off the vlog. So if you haven't yet subscribed, subscribe, like, please leave a comment. I like interacting with you guys. Monday, a lot of the time, who is here with me. Hello, Monday. Um, a lot of the times, uh, she actually reads the comments, she enjoys them and she is really curious about what I'm going to say about them. Yeah, we really enjoy and appreciate the comments and, and by sharing your sharing, liking, comment, you really support me on this channel and I really appreciate that. I'm your boy Veli Smith and thank you for having tuned in once again. Really much appreciated.